You're on. It's on. Okay. Five minutes. I'm excited to be the first one and set the stage. I hope I can keep the time. And I'm a fast talker, so I'm going to try to talk less, but keep it efficient. Thanks for inviting me. This is an exciting format. We are focusing on um, adolescents' affect in situations where it's most ecologically relevant and meaningful for them. So as we all know by now, from personal experience, from our science, from just following the media, adolescents engage in lots of reward-directed behaviors. And they engage in these behaviors sometimes risky behaviors, in social contexts. Um, and when I say social context, I mean specifically friendships. This is where adolescents might do things like try drugs, engage in risky sexual behaviors, drive recklessly, um, uh, do other things that kind of put them in danger. And depression, as we've talked about all day today actually, involves important social context changes and difficulties. And even though we wouldn't see it as involving the same kind of risky behavior you'd see in uh, adolescent social context, it's certainly from views ranging from neuroeconomics to affective neuroscience to developmental psychopathology to um, evolutionary psychology involves disruptions in social functioning as well as difficulties managing positive affect with low levels of positive affect and disruptions in neural reward circuitry. So we wanted to know whether trying to understand positive affect in a context where it occurs most frequently and most intensely, that is in peer friendships in adolescence, can help us understand disruptions in reward circuitry in depression. We have found in previous work that adolescents with depression show less responding to reward in neural reward circuitry. And this has now been done in a bunch of studies or meta-analyses, and it's a pretty consistent finding. We actually were even able to take this to to show that areas where we saw disruptions or differences between depressed and healthy adolescents, in this case a striatum, um, were related to adolescents' experience of positive emotions in their real world experiences as measured by um, ecological momentary assessment. And of course, a lot of those assessments were done in friendship or peer context, as it turns out, so it's relevant. On the other hand, this is still just response to standardized reward in the form of money and doesn't capture what's really most rewarding and most important for adolescents in their experiences. So we went on to try to use what we know about adolescents' positive affect and reward to develop an fMRI task to really capture individual differences more effectively and more meaningfully. So we got um, adolescents to come into the lab with their best same-sex friend and do an interaction that would engage them and generate lots of positive affect. We do this in typical adolescents, age 14 to 18, as a starting point. And like typical adolescents, they showed a range of depressive symptoms, which isn't surprising. So it could be a promising start. Um, and we used a tried and true method, which is to get them to come in and do an interaction around a previously agreed upon topic or set of topics that are related to positive emotions. And I had great collaborators on this study, including Nick Allen and Jennifer Silk, who are here. Ron Dahl and Lisa Schieber, and we got them, we, so with their um, ideas, we got them to come in and say, tell us about the best time you've ever had together, or the most fun you've ever had. And I'm showing you some very tame examples of the kinds of topics that came up, <laughs> and I promise you we saw lots more exciting stuff to show us that this was actually a valid uh, method for assessing adolescents' positive affect in friendship context, because we heard about things like sexual behavior, internet risk-taking, um, hopes for future risk taking, including two kids who talked about running with the bulls in Pamplona someday as a goal of theirs. Um, but anyway, these are some of the nicer things like going to the local amusement park, staying up late together to watch TV shows, right? Those are both sort of pleasure related experiences or goals. Graduating, being co presidents of the senior class, the young man on the right, his goals are more related to achievement. Um, so taking that data and coding it, with help um, and guided by Judith Morgan, who's also here today, we were able to extract video clips showing positive affect or neutral affect from the friend here, and positive affect and neutral affect from a stranger of the similar age, similar, similar age, same sex as the friend. And use those in the scanner so that kids would watch each clip three times in the kind of mixed up order and have pauses in between to be able to measure their responses to positive affect from someone they are close to and care about from a context they just were in a few weeks, uh, two weeks ago at most, and relating to an experience that they shared with this important person in their lives. So we call it the BFF task, or the best friend, uh, fMRI task. So I won't go into a ton of details, but the good news is the task works. We see a response in brain regions relevant to reward, relevant to self-processing, 
social processing. We also see, oh man. Just, okay, <laughs> so am I cut off? Okay, okay. All right, so we also see, and, we, and similarly, in a circuit level way, we see functional connectivity in similar in, in networks that are involved, again, in positive affect, reward, social processing. Furthermore, these effects we saw were related to individual differences in depression. So kids who had higher levels of depression showed less responding in key reward areas, like the ventral striatum, or the orbital frontal cortex, the top here, and less response in the precuneus, a really interesting and a bit mysterious brain region that seems involved in kind of positive social processing. So things like agency, uh, low tendency to brood, autobiographical memory that's positive, also showed less in kids um, who had higher levels of depression. My favorite, my favorite quote that I can show later if anyone's interested. But in any case, I wanted to say that our first foray into understanding depression and depression from a social neuroscience of friendship perspective has been promising so far. It's been relevant. Of course, the next step will be to take it to more serious psychopathology, including depression, but including other reward-related problems like obesity, risk-taking, um, or substance use. And in short, I encourage everyone to think of things in a socially grounded but effective neuroscience framework when trying to understand what the neural mechanism of depression might be. Thanks. Okay, and you can read my